we're going to get started. I want to open us up, open us up in prayer. So let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. And Lord, we know many people who are sick right now, some even in our class that are not doing well. We have friends that have contracted contracted this COVID and are in the hospital. And we pray for them, Lord, that you would touch their bodies. Lord, we pray for healing. And as I've prayed many times before, I continue to pray, God, that you'll let this COVID virus pass quickly and uh, get us back to some sense of normalcy. And we just pray in whatever circumstances we find ourselves in that, that you'll use it for your glory, even, even this pandemic, use it for your glory. I thank you for each person that's able to join us. I know everybody's got a lot of things going on, uh, and I just thank you for their time. And we love each one of them, and those, even those that are not able to be here, we just, we just lift them up to you, Lord, and just uh, let them feel the love that we send their way, and you wrap your arms around them, Lord. And we give you praise. In your name we pray. Bless this time together. Amen. Okay, I'm going to turn the mic over to, oh, turn the mic over to Mike. Mike. Thank you, David. Mike will take the mic. And Linda, if you'll go ahead and uh, unmute yourself, and John, that'd be great too. Uh, we've got a really interesting uh, stuff uh, for tonight. Uh, lots of us uh, are interested in the church history and things that have gone on in the past and all that kind of stuff. But tonight we've got the author and the editor, rather, excuse me, of our most recent church history book. Linda Gilden is, is with us. And she led a team of people that, uh, that developed this uh, church history book, uh, I guess, a year ago. It was about a five-year project. And, uh, and it's a beautiful book. And if uh, you don't have one, it'd be worth your while to buy one. It's about 20 bucks, I think. And, uh, and it's a great book to have, and it's uh, really set up real nicely. So Linda and John are joining us tonight and uh, going to be doing the um, uh, presentation of this history. We're going to lead them through some questions, and we're going to have a conversation about the church history. And I want to thank Linda and John for doing all that they've done. Uh, they've actually put together slides and stuff like that, and we're going to be sharing our screen. Linda's going to be sharing her screen with us, so you'll be seeing a screen more than you'll be seeing uh, any, either of us tonight. So it'll be something that you'll enjoy seeing and doing. We are recording this tonight. The, one of the reasons we're recording this is that because Linda wanted to share it with her daddy. Now, her daddy's one of my very favorite people. Uh, Bill Jeffords is a very, uh, ju he's just one of the most um, Christ-like people I know. Has a wonderful history uh, within our church and has just been a phenomenal leader within our church. So I'm delighted that we're sharing that with uh, tonight with, uh, with uh, Bill. So Bill, I hope you and Ruby are doing well and that y'all are continuing to enjoy your time there at uh, Summit Hills and I pray that God's being kind and good to you too. So Linda, thank you for doing all this tonight. And uh, so you wanna get started and talk a little bit about this stuff and tell us why you like telling the story so much with the uh, First Baptist and how we got started with it, who all did it and all that kind of stuff. So why don't you give ourselves an introduction and then we'll go from there. That was a lot of questions all rolled into one. Sure. Uh, several years ago, well now it's probably been more like 10 or more years ago, um, I told Britt, I had read our history book, and we, we did have a history book. This is, Mary Green wrote this, and it went through, or it goes through 1982, which is probably before most of us, or a lot of you, even came to the church. And I can get really excited talking about our church and the fun things that we have in our heritage, the legacy of those that have gone behind, before us, and very few people realize 
that some of this stuff even went on. So I can get really excited about that. Um, I have had five generations of my family in the church. Right now we have four generations that attend. Uh, so it's just been a family thing for us. We grew up with daddy being at the church a lot. And, um, you know, everything, every time something happened, we, we were right there with daddy would tell us about it. We'd pray for the church. We, you know, we just prayed for our ministers and it just really, my parents instilled in me a love for the church as did my grandfather, who was the fifth generation, who's no longer here. But um, we became, or I became, and I talked to several people, it just was such a shame for all this good stuff to go pass us by with, without being recorded. Um, Mrs. Green had done a great job up until 1982, but I felt like there was a lot that we needed to hurry up and get down or we were going to forget it. And so we de developed a committee. Ms. Mike was with us on that. Um, I, I just, my hat's off to that whole committee. I love them all so much. They stuck with us during the whole five years here. And um, anytime Britt says, well, we need to fill in this gap, you know, somebody stepped up to the plate and did that. And so uh, Mike was one of those. Candy Arrington one, was one of those. Debbie, Be Debbie Beck. And um, her husband, Carl, he helped us edit it. Michelle and Britt, of course, and Nate, their whole team were wonderful. Uh, Grady Stewart had some stories for, for us, as did my dad. And, you know, I was just always picking their brains about, well, tell me how this happened. I just found this piece of information. Were you there? And, and tell me what happened. So I just want to share a little bit about that and hope you'll catch the enthusiasm and the the, the good pride that we can have in our church because we've been a church who had followed God's leading since 1839. We were the very first church in what was called the Wicked Village of Spartanburg. So we had quite a mission and um, we were pioneers. There were other churches, probably, I think there were about 25 or 30 other churches in Spartanburg County, but there was none that was ministering to that wicked village what was down, which was downtown over near where the courthouse was. I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. Is that okay, Mike? Sure. The, yeah. While you're doing that, tell us about who our first pastor was and how we got started and all that kind of good stuff. Well, I have a picture of him. Would you like to see him? Sure. Um, this is the way that our first... Are you seeing that now? Are we good? Uh, you're, you're not full screen. All right. Here we go. Got it. This was a picture, there are very few pictures of our first and second churches, but this is a picture that we have of the first church, and um, it was built in on the site of the old log cabin jail, which was down by the courthouse on Magnolia Street. You can go down there and drive in the parking lot, you can drive up to a certain place and see a plaque that was placed there in 1939 in honor of our 100th birthday. So there are some things that are down there as well. But this is what the church looked like. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And John Landrum, oh my goodness, there's a typo. John Landrum was our first pastor. And the, the city of Landrum is named after him. Which he, he became a really big figure in not only the religious sector of our of our. Um, state but he also was in politics a little bit and um he he became very well known and so he was our first pastor he was there um he came in, in 1839 he was there for several years but he got his cousin to come and lead the singing now his cousin's name was william walker but they called him sing billy walker and that's his picture on the right and um, he is very well known because he developed the system of singing. He wrote a hymn book called um, Southern Harmony, and then another one that used the notes that were shaped so that each person, you sang the note that was the shape of your part, so you didn't have to go pick out your part. I guess is why, I don't know. But anyway, the singing Billy Walker develop, developed that. He... Um, used it in our church, but then he used it again to write another hymn book. So he wrote several hymn books, and um, the really, there's a lot of neat things about him, but singing Billy Walker was the first person 
to ever put the tune, which I think is called um, something about Britain. Anyway, he, he matched Amazing Grace, the words, up with the tune of this song. That we, and it's the way we sing it today. He was the first person to put those words in that tune together, and it stuck. And so now it's sung all over the world, and that started right there in our church, which I think was phenomenal. Uh, we have so much heritage that is just such a wonderful thing. During the time of John Landrum, though, there were some interesting things that happened. Um, along the music lines with um, Billy, they decided that um, the, the choir was kind of taken away from the worship experience of the congregation. So they abolished the choir for almost 30 years. And they felt like people would have a more complete worship experience rather than listening to the choir or singing with them, but to sing by themselves where they were in the, in the um, congregation. So that, that happened back in 1853. And that was, I think that's huge that they just told the choir they were done for a while and then they let everybody sing and enjoy the worship themselves. Um, the first time that our church ever needed two services was in 1857, which was right along, right in those lines. There's so much that happened during that first period of time. And it wasn't too long after they began meeting, though, that they needed another sanctuary. Their sanctuary was just not big enough. And so they began to look around. Well, what happened was Major Dean, Major H.J.J. Dean, heard that we were looking for a place for our new church. And he owned a, a piece of land in downtown Spartanburg. It was on the corner of May, East Main Street and Dean Street. And he wanted to give it to the church. But the church met and they decided that that piece of property was just too far out of town. So they turned it down. Well, as you know now, that's where our church sits. We had to buy it um, many years later. And so we passed it up, though, because it was just too far out of town. And I think where the courthouse is, it's not that far away, but to go that far on your horse, I guess, was a lot, um, a lot more to deal with. The way that they let people know it was time for church was that they rang the bell, and that bell is still out in the courtyard right outside the chapel door. Um, the bell rang, and people would come to church. It rang with the start of the war. It rang to signify the end of the war. And we had a little lady in the church named Amaryllis Bomer. Can't you just picture her? I mean, perfect name for that time period. And uh, Miss Bomer rang the bell, and she lit the candles for the church. And the committee uh, agreed to pay her $5 for doing that. But Ms. Bummer did not want that. She wanted them to take that money, save it, and use it to buy pulpit chairs for the church because she felt like that was something we needed. So with her money, of our, her $5, these are the pulpit chairs that were bought. And they still sit in our heritage room today. If you haven't been to the heritage room, we've got tons more stuff there. And um, there's just so much more than we can cover even in these few minutes tonight. But those pulpit chairs are there in the heritage room. And you might look at them and go, I know I'm jumping down a little bit, but you know that our church had a fire and the sanctuary was destroyed. These pulpit chairs were not destroyed because we had lent them to Croft Baptist Church as they were establishing their church. So during the period of the fire, these, uh oh, sorry, these uh, chairs ended up at Croft, and so they were not burned. Well, you're now at the second house of worship. That's right. I hit the, I just touched the computer and it went boom. So it went boom. Yeah. Okay. So um, now we're in the second house of worship. Uh, it was during that time while we were in that second house. Um, that the ladies got together finally and, or I guess not finally, but it was not exactly a, the WMU, but they called themselves the Ladies Aid Society. And at one point they decided that the carpets in the church and the floors need cleaning. So all the ladies got together and sold vanilla flavoring so that they could make money to clean the carpets in, in the church, polish the floors, 
and by the janitor, a clock. Now, I don't know if the janitor was always late where he was going or what, but for some reason, they thought he needed to have a clock. So these ladies raised $52.15 so that they could have all those things done and um, take care of that part of our church. So speaking of our church, we have a long history of developing and planting churches I think we used to call them mission churches at one point in time through the years, but now we call them church plants. So talk to us a little bit about the, what our church has done as related to church plants. Well, um, we, we kind of have two sets of church plants. We have the earlier church plants, which, is, um, which began to happen back in the uh, early 1900s. And then we have I'm going to skip this slide and go into the church plant so you can see the, these. The first, the first church plant that we ever, we ever bought, uh, built was Green Street Baptist Church. And that was in 1891. There were, Green Street has an amazing history. Uh, they were, the church was built to minister to the mill village that was surrounded it. But the church began to meet all kinds of needs in the community they um, built the first hospital that was here in town. It was down in that area, which later merged with another hospital. This one was called the Good Samaritan Hospital that Green Street bought, I mean built. But then it merged with another hospital in town to become Spartanburg Regional. So they have that in their legacy over at Green Street. Green Street Baptist Church also had the very first Bible school in South Carolina which I think is just amazing that we have that right here. And um, Green Street, of course, was the one who did that. The Southside Baptist Church, you're all probably familiar. You've gone past it near the post office. They just felt like they needed another church in town. So Southside was established. Calvary Baptist was established down on the um, area near the hospital. And then Croft Baptist Church was established out in the Camp Croft area. Buckeye Forest was out. It's out near Welford. I don't know if that's exact, if Welford is its mailing address, but it's out in that area. I can remember on Sunday afternoons, we had to ride out there when they were building it because Daddy wanted to see how the building was going. And so we would get in the car and ride out there and see how the church was going. And then the Fernwood Baptist, of course, was established in 1959, which you may not know it's a fairly new church when you look at it that way, um, but it was built for the Fernwood, the east side of Spartanburg, so that we would have a plant there. Um, as you know, we were given Green Street Baptist back um, in 2016, I believe it was, and it has become, again, a real ministry in that area where it is on the north side of Spartanburg. I, you know, I think um, I, I, I interrupted your tale a while ago, but you go back up one slide back to the third house of worship. Yeah, I don't know how those got mixed up, but sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. But, but anyway, I think that uh, I think that I never had the privilege of worshiping in that uh, building, but I understand that uh, uh, I know you and Mike did, and some other members of our uh, class did. Uh, that was a pretty special place. How about telling us about that? That was the most beautiful church, that yellow brick, and you went inside, and they had all the dark wood and the balconies, and it just was a beautiful church to be a part of, and I always felt very formal in there, and Mike would probably agree, because at that time, um, our pastor, when, when Dr. Slaughter came, and which was during my lifetime and my time there, he always wore tails to preach in. So I felt like the church sanctuary was a very formal and special place. It was just, it was just a really beautiful um, place to go in. The bell was in the bell tower there that you see on the right. And um, it had a, that beautiful stained glass window, which was destroyed in the fire. So um, Mike, do you have anything you want to add to that? Um, you may have something you remember more. I remember how long that aisle seemed when we were doing the GA coron coronation. I remember that very well. And I remember the, the um, seats that 
folded down. I remember sitting over on the left side of the sanctuary almost every Sunday. And um, I just, I have, I have really fond memories of that church. It's the stained glass window there at the balcony was just beautiful. And um, yeah, I don't think any of us had ever had a chance to worship in that. We'll forget it. Well, Linda, Linda, pardon me. Where is that church? That church was right where our church sits. The sanctuary burned down, and we're going to get to that in a minute too, but this, the sanctuary burned down, and um, we rebuilt on the same spot. Okay. So this is actually um, on the spot that Major Dean tried to give us many, many years ago, and so it was for this church that they ended up purchasing that lot. So... I'm gonna go back through the church plants. One thing in that um, in that new the uh, third church was there in in time of war, and there was there were quite a few soldiers at um, Camp Croft. And I just learned today, Mike told me that Henry Kissinger was stationed out there at one point. Who would have known? I didn't know that. So that's really good for us to all know. But the, our church took it very seriously that we wanted to minister to the soldiers. And we actually had a um, church entertainment committee or camp I mean, entertainment committee, I think it was called. And they voted to buy benches to put on the front lawn so that the soldiers would have some place to sit when they came to town under the trees in the shade. And so I thought that was really good, but they also, the WMU especially got really involved and they helped set up Sunday afternoon uh, socials, I think they were called back then, and Marilyn Scruggs was involved in that. I don't know if anybody else was involved in it that's still in the church, but uh, these Sunday afternoon socials, they would play ping pong with the soldiers, they would have refreshments, they would sing at the piano, and then they would take time to write notes home to the soldiers' families, telling them that they had seen their soldier, and that he was doing fine, and they were glad that they had been in the church that day. I think that's really sweet. I think it is too. And I, you know, and Camp Croft still exists today, but not as a military post. And uh, but you can go out there and you can see remnants of that from from that point in time. So tell right. us about some of the other highlights from the 1940s and 50s. What's going on well, there? Even one thing. Excuse Can me? I mention one thing? Yes. I grew up at Craft Croft Baptist Church. Did you cool. know that? And uh, yes, I remember the. it was an army chapel originally when I was a little girl. I remember we had the funeral home fans because we didn't have air conditioning. And I remember when they finally put in air conditioning and just some other things. But I started playing the piano at church when I was 12 years old in 1972 um, at that church that you're talking about. That's I, was awesome. baptized there. I was married there. We actually sent quite a few of our people, I think, over there to help begin that church. Um, right. The ministers were heavily involved in that. Right. Um, I've heard stories of some of that, but it's just, it's just really special to me personally, you know, that uh, that's where I began. That's where I, that's where I came to know the Lord and that our church built that church and, you know, anyway, just a lot of very special tugs at my heart when you were talking about that. That's great. Thank you for that. Yeah, there was so much that, that happened during the ministry during in that yellow church. Um, it was hard to decide what was the best thing to talk about and what, what would you really like to know about it. I mean, it was during the 1900s to, to the 1950s in there where um, we developed our children's ministry, we developed Bible school, our Boy Scout troop came to be, um, the student ministry actually began, our first student minister was like 1925. So a lot of stuff happened prior to that. And then um, on February 23rd, 1930, which was the 90th anniversary of our beginnings, we became the first um, church in Spartanburg to broadcast worship on WSPA. Well, that and, was a radio broadcast, correct? Excuse me? The radio, yes, it was on the radio. 
Yeah. So then after that, it was right at the end of the 40s uh, that the deaf community came to our church. They had built the um, South Carolina School for the Deaf down um, where it is now in that area. And Dr. Walker, not our Dr. Walker, but another Dr. Walker who was president of the school, um, he worked very closely with us to help us develop that program so we would be able to meet the needs of a deaf congregation. And that has been a tremendous ministry. It's gone in so many directions, but it always comes back to the fact that we have had a strong deaf ministry. And they have, um, at one time, there was a church uh, pastor that was specifically for the deaf. And um, they've had deaf revivals. They've had, uh, they have Sunday school. And obviously we have the interpreters, which we see every Sunday um, down on the right side at the front. So the deaf has been a big part of our ministry. In 1952, um, that's Dr. Slaughter came, and that's when they talked, began to um, establish our um, television ministry. Of course, it was black and white in the beginning, and um, the kind of cool thing was, well, I don't guess it was really cool to those who had to do it, but WSPA was right, let me see which slide it's next, because I've got a picture of this. Um, sorry. All right, you see the building that's kind of on the right top, the white kind of light colored building, that is WSPA. And that sat on the site where our senior parking lot is right now outside the chapel. So when they began the TV ministry, they would go over to WSPA and there was this um, cable about, I don't know, probably six or eight inches di in diameter. They took the cable out the door of WSPA, drug it down the sidewalk, and into the church so that they could do our first TV broadcast. So it's not quite, um, it hasn't been quite as um, highly technological as it is these days, but um, that was really something to see them do that. And that's how we began because we, we drug it down there. Um, you can actually see on the picture on the left is Dr. Slaughter and Walter Brown who both were instrumental in starting the TV, but Walter Brown was president of WSPA at the time. And um, he believed in what we were doing. He wanted to see us get on. And he, he just um, really made sure that we were able to do that and, and to do it financially. He, he did a great job with negotiating that kind of stuff. So you can see behind them too, that's our sanctuary, our first, san uh, the yellow sanctuary, the yellow church, the third house. And then the bottom, we've got a, p a picture of our new control room. And I think we talked about this maybe a couple of weeks ago, but if you have never been to the control room in our church, um, please take time one Sunday to go down there. It is a worship experience in and of itself, just to watch what is going on down there and the commitment of these guys that sit down there Sunday after Sunday. Did you want to say something? <laughs> We'd love to have you. I mean, it's, it's, it's so interesting. And the pictures that you see there uh, you know, of the control room, it's just amazing. And uh, actually, we are a backup for WSPA. If anything were to happen, they could move into our control room and broadcast uh, all of the news and all of the programming from our control room. Now, I did not know that we, that we could have that ability to do that. I yeah. did not know that. That's, that's really interesting. That, yeah, that kind of tells you what a good yeah. control room we have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But okay. it, is, it, it is interesting. All right. After, uh, you know, while Dr. Slaughter was there, the fire happened, correct? It did. Yes. Um, in 1962, um, November 13th, I remember my dad coming in and waking me up and he took me by the hand and we went to wake up my brother and my sister and he told us that the church was on fire and that it looked like it was just going to be a total loss and we immediately got in the car and went up there and joined fellow church members who stood in the, you know, stood in the street 
and just watched it burn. We were helpless, really, to do anything more than watch it. Of course, the firemen were there, and um, they, they did everything they could. It, ironically, Dr. Slaughter, about um, two Christmases before this, had made a real big deal about cautioning the church and the church family about putting candles and using fire in the church. And, um, you know, everybody kind of remembered that when the time, you know, when the church started to burn. Um, another thing, too, that um, we have some, we had some really wonderful pictures that Randy Bradford took. And the way that he got those, he, um, somebody called him and told him the church was on fire. And his office, his studio was right down the street. So he stopped by his studio and filled up his pockets with film and got his camera. That was back film days. Got his camera. Well, he taught Sunday school in the intermediate class, which is upstairs now, where uh, it, which was upstairs uh, near the Encouraging Word. It was next door to where the Encouraging Word was, has their offices now. And so Randy went the back way up there because he knew his way around. And he was able to go in and get some pictures that nobody else got because he, he, he just snuck in. I mean, there's nothing, no other way to say it. He snuck in. But um, it did give us pictures that no one else had. So that was really um, cool. You can't, these, these are grainy. These are newspaper pictures. But you can, even in this one, you can see the beautiful millwork on the um, balconies back behind like in the middle of that picture and and the picture fall you know with the beams that had fallen down and it was just a really sad time for our church because we grieved together but it also brought us closer we did not miss a Sunday because of the fire we were able to begin meeting in uh, Evans Junior High at the time in their auditorium which was down the street, uh, down Dean Street, is where the Evans Resource Center is now. Um, they just dragged the cable down there instead of dragging it over from WSPA. So um, that, was, that was really good. Eventually we moved back into the Screven Hall, which was the dining hall of our church at that time. It's back, um, it was back where the rooms 146 and all those rooms are back in that area. But we eventually moved there for our church services until the new church was was ready. And um, that was in 1966 in November when um, we moved into our new sanctuary. Um, it seated 1600, which we thought was gigantic at the time. But um, along with our TV studio ministry, we actually now could fill that sanctuary up about 130 times um, with the ones who are watching on Sunday as well. So the reach of the church has just continued to grow. It's, it's a phenomenal story. Uh, at the tail end of whenever we moved into that new sanctuary, I believe Dr. Walker came within a couple of years of that, isn't that correct? It was. Dr. Slaughter decided he was going to stay until until we got into the new sanctuary. And um, I think he probably could have retired early, a little earlier than that, but that he committed to being there and to seeing that project through. And that was a really, um, I, I admire him for that. I was just so glad to see him every time I saw him. You know, as a child, he was one of these pastors who just loved the kids in the church. And every time he saw us, you know, he would hug us or love on us. Um, just like I've seen Alistair do, and I've seen Don do it so many times. Uh, our six-year-old granddaughter, she's liable to say something like, guess who I saw today? And we'll say, who? I saw that man who loves me. And she's talking about Don. She never calls him by his name. It's always the man who loves me. And um, so, you know, I kind of felt that way about Dr. Slaughter and um, the way that he treated us as kids was, was really cool. Dr. Walker's pastor, it began in 1968, and that brought a really new um, dimension to the whole church because it was during that time that Ronald Wells came, Bobby Haley came, 
um, the, the, the ministries of the church began to grow during that time in a way they hadn't. And I think Dr. Walker was a big part of that because he wanted to, he wanted to see that happen, but he had such a heart for ministry. And so um, when Bobby Haley came and was looking for something for the youth to do, Dr. Walker says, well, you really need to go to Kentucky. Um, that was the year after Dr. Walker came and he, his first pastorate was in Middlesbrough, Kentucky, and he had never, never lost a love for those people up there. So Alistair got with Bobby and they created this first trip to Kentucky, which was just amazing. It was incredible. We had never, um, as a youth group, we had never done anything like that before. And, and the idea of just of going up there and really just depending on God, not being, not knowing what was going to be doing, done next or how we we're going to do it. And it was just life changing for those of us who went. There were 30 on the first trip. And um, it was also the year before that, that we had the first youth choir tour. Ronald Wells had come, and I don't know if you ever, if y'all knew Ronald or not, but he was probably one of the most godly men I've ever known, and, and one of the most musical men. I mean, he, the first time we had choir, we were sitting in the old choir room, and he walks in with a napkin, and he says, I've just written this. I want y'all to sing it in four-part harmony. And he was just the kind of person, he, if he says sing it in four-part harmony, you just kind of do it. I mean, you know, and so it was a song, Haggai, which is part of I Wonder. It was not the first song, but it was uh, one of the songs in I Wonder. And so Ronald became a very important part of the church's music life, but also the lives of those of us who were able to be in his choirs. But well, that, you know, you talk about uh, Ronald, you know, Mary Jane is still a part of the church. Mary Jane is his wife. Yes. And, uh, and you know, I believe Teresa had something to do with I Wonder through the years, too. Yeah, Lee did too. Didn't Lee play the trumpet in it? Was it you, David? One of y'all played the trumpet in it, I think. Maybe. Lee, Lee was the one who played the trumpet. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, well, that was a great, I mean, it was, it was such a ministry and such an outreach to music that we had never done before. And we just, we were able to learn how many people really needed that message. And if we, you know, wherever we went, people responded to that, me that message. In the beginning, we went to churches, but after, um, I don't know how many years, it switched and they began to go into prisons. And um, yeah. I can remember can, some can phenomenal in times in the first prisons. But, in? Teresa, somebody saying something? Yeah, mm -hmm. Teresa. Um, in 1978, I met Ronald Wells at, at Quincy's Family Steakhouse, if you remember Quincy's. And it was spring break. And like you're saying, he was one of the most godly men that has ever walked the face of this earth, I'm convinced. But um, I was simply waiting on him. He didn't know my last name. He came back a week later and said that God had told him that I needed to go on choir tour. He'd never heard me play. He didn't know anything about me. And um, that's what brought me to First Baptist. And you're right that um, the ministry had, at that point, had just begun to go into prisons. And, um, but working with Ron and Mary Jane Wells changed my life. And I, I am forever grateful because that's what brought me to First Baptist. And, Linda, you're just so right about so much of this. I went to Kentucky, too. That, that was a life-changing thing, too. But the music ministry, and Mar Wells did write songs on napkins often. And then he would give me signals at the piano for me to play it. And it was crazy, but um, a lot of wonderful memories there. Yes. Uh, I was just, I was very thankful that my kids also got to grow up with him and and, you know, play in some uh, ringer singers and those kind of things that he did and sing in, the, sing in his choirs. And, um, you know, Mary Jane was, um, she directed everything we did. And she was uh, just a master organizer. And she had every, every little thing done when we went on choir tour. She knew where we were going to be when and what we were going to eat and why and all of that kind of stuff. And it just made it so easy for Ronald to use his giftedness 
to be what God had called him to be. And um, so it was really great. It was neat to see the two of them work together because they were a team. So what were some of the other ministries that Alistair was involved in during his, uh, during his time as pastor? During his time, it was the time that we had the first helping center, which if, you, um, if you're familiar with the church, there were buildings on the parking lot we used. There was, at, they've been, the helping center had been at several different places. Uh, the the um, building that was down to the right of the church as you came down the hill, and then there was a building up in the corner. I think we have a picture. Uh, I'm going to talk about rice bowls in a minute. But the helping center there shows you that was in the um, corner nearest Barnett Park up on the hill, sort of, I believe. And um, that, was, that was something that Alistair really felt like that he needed to do uh, was to minister to our to our church, um, not our church, but our community family. When Alistair, pretty soon, I think, when he, after he came to where we were, he went to India on a mission trip. And as he tells it, when he walked through those streets, he would come back to his room and just pray and pray and pray that God would show him some way that we could help to feed these hungry people that were in, in India and that we could help them um, to know Jesus. And so that's when um, Alistair began talking to George Schrieffer about the rice bowls. And since the time, George, I think, uh, came up with the model. It's this little plastic. The brown is the bowl and the white. It looks like rice if you can see it, but you can't really see it good on the computer. But that ministry is still in existence and feeds hungry people, children, families all over the world. It's no longer in our church, but it started there. And um, any of us that were there during that time had our own little rice bowl that we filled up. And um, so that was one of his ministries that has been, um, had a lot of longevity to it. During his time, we came, uh, we had the pastoral care ministry to start. We had a counseling center at that time. The Young at Heart started. Um, the Preschool ministry officially started with the uh, weekday preschool during his time, and the media ministry grew as well. Also during that time, um, the recreation ministry um, came into effect, and Dr. Walker brought Kaz McCaslin to our church to run the um, recreation ministry, and he did a fantastic job, but Kaz did such a good job that he, that that ministry outgrew our church very quickly. I think it took about um, maybe two, no, not very right. But maybe, I don't know exactly how long he was there. I, I would probably say it wrong if I said it. But in the event, in the end, what happened was Kaz began looking to see how we could build more gyms in our area, in our church, for other people to reach out to them with the, the gospel. As it turned out, Kaz left our church and started Upward Sports. And so our church was also the birthplace of the Upward Sports Ministry, which is international. People all over, around the world, I don't know the exact figures of uh, how many people they reach, but it's a lot. It's a lot. And so um, that began as well in our church. Was there anything you thought about, Mike, that was during that time? Um, let's well, see. Let, me, let, me, let me add on to uh, what you said about Kaz. Okay. Uh, Upward, uh, Kaz uh, started Upward as an organization after Don came, somewhere around 94, somewhere right in there, 94, 95. And, uh, and quite literally, millions of kids have been impacted by upward sports through the years. So it's a tremendous ministry. Uh, that started right there at the First Baptist Church. Yes. Uh, so, I, I, you know, the, one of my favorite things that happened during that time, and I think you've got a slide on this somewhere, and I had to do it the Passion Play. So, yes. So uh, you want to talk about that a little bit? I would love to. We also started Crafty Connections, and Mrs. Mrs. Mike's mom was very involved in Crafty Connections, so um, I put that slide in there for her. That's for Francis. 
So, um, my very favorite people. Yes. Um, so, in 1985, we had begun to do Easter plays, um, Easter dramas at our church, and it just got to where we were totally, we had outgrown it. So, we moved the Passion Play to the Spartanburg Memorial Auditorium, and they estimated about 37,000 people inter, uh, attended this over the course of time. But to me, the really cool thing, there were so many cool things about this. But it was one of the things that I still to this day love about the Passion Play is that it was a multi-generational event. There was nobody that wanted to be in the Passion Play that wasn't. And that meant that there were a lot of kids in the Passion Play. I don't know, one of these pictures, I really don't have one that's got the whole cast, but the kids, I mean, some of them were just an angel or some of them were just a shepherd's boy or some of them, but it, it wasn't that they were just an angel. If that angel hadn't been in there, it wouldn't have been the same without them. But I know our kids during that time, and they were younger, um, Jeff was probably five and our girls were probably um, like 10, 10 and 12 or so, but they were assigned to an adult from our church. And that adult looked after a little group of children every night uh, during the passion play. And so when they weren't on stage, that adult was talking to them, playing games with them. And our kids loved it because they got to know adults they didn't know. And I loved it because it was another chance for our kids to rub shoulders with godly men and women who loved kids and get to know them better so that they had another person that they could connect with of a different generation in the church. Um, so that's kind of the way that the passion play went. It was, um, it was just a phenomenal thing. Um, Canella built the sets for it. I mean, we did everything there was for it. A lot of people will talk about the animals because we had a little trouble every now and then with the animals. The camel couldn't get under the balcony or he didn't want to go up the ramp or, you know, there were all kinds of things that we had to um, figure out how to do to work, to work with the animals and that. But, that was indeed one of one of the most uh, fun things, most exciting things, most unifying things I think that our church ever did. Oh, Another yeah. thing that was a multi generational deal. Um, this this just shows you a woman's ministry, um, which Ladies First Thursday was a part of that. This is kind of like the Ladies Aid Society. We got then we went to the WMU, and then we in the um, '90s, Dr. Walker had some ideas about what he wanted us to do for that. So our women's ministry here again grew and reached a lot of women. We also had on our 150th birthday we had a sesquicentennial celebration. Um, our birthday was Steph. February 23rd, 1839 was when the church started. So in 1989, we all dressed like the period. We um, dressed our children like the period, which some of them thought was cool and some of them did not. And uh, we had dinner on the grounds. We took lots of pictures. Cliff Barrows came and led the music for us. He, he and George Beverly Shea came and arrived in a carriage that came up the front to the front of the church. One of the, one of the things I remember most, well, not maybe most, but one of the things I remember and think about a lot because it was just such a fun thing was uh, there was a couple in our church named the Fogels and um, Woody had a lighting, Fogel lighting down on Pine Street if you knew where that was. But um, just like all the rest of us, um, his wife was named Claudia, and, and she had writ, had um, made herself a gorgeous dress. Um, it was she had the bonnet to match. She had the, all of that kind of stuff, and she put these great big hoops in her skirt so she would look exactly like they were during 1839. Well, they got ready to go to church. She got him dressed, and she put on her dress, and they went out the door and got ready to get in their car. Their car was a Honda. It was not a big car. And Claudian could not get in the car. So her husband, Woody, put her in the back of his pickup truck and drove her to church that day for the sesquicentennial celebration. I thought that was just so much fun. I mean, how creative. Aren't we glad he had a truck? Because I don't know how we'd have gotten her there otherwise. 
And I remember both Woody and Claudia. Yes. Uh, I remember that day very well. Yeah. Right after that, uh, you know, I guess probably about five years later, Dr. Wilton came. Why don't you tell us about some of the things that happened with Don and all that kind of good stuff? Who would have ever thought that we would have a second pastor from South Africa? Not only did we have Dr. Walker, who was from South, born and raised in South Africa, but then we had Dr. Wilton to come. And I guess it was a good thing, and God had it all planned because our ears were already used to the South African um, accent. But Don came in 1993, and of course, he's still there. During that time, um, Camp Voyager became part of the recreation ministry, which was a really cool thing for them. Um, and, you know, a lot of times I've collected stories from people or from teens for various projects that we've done around the church. And Camp Voyager comes up so much. You know, if it wasn't for Camp Voyager, that's where I met Jesus. And I mean, they're doing a great job. So um, that's one of the things that began during that time. Our church also um, planted some new plants during his time. Um, these are the ones that we currently have planted. Vintage Church in New Orleans. Um, and they have built a new building. Uh, Canal Street in New Orleans was not long after that. People might wonder why we have to have two in New Orleans. Well, in New Orleans, there's two million people that don't know Jesus. And these two churches are in very different areas of New Orleans. New Orleans. Uh, the Vintage Church is in Midtown, and Canal Street is down in, on, on Canal Street, which is a very different dynamic. Um, also, we had um, Awaken Church in Charleston and Encounter, which is in, in Boston. Then the gathering meets at the Un United Baptist Church, which is a, pair, a picture of this here. And then Rob Wilson and his family have just recently in the last couple of years moved to Pittsburgh to plant Vintage Church there. So we are continuing to reach out to the world um, through church plants, through mission trips, all of those things. Our church has always had a rich mission history. We've got chapels and um, water pumps and wells and named after people in our church right now that um, were just came because they got, went over there and had a real burden for clean water for people or that they needed a chapel or whatever. So we are continuing with that. Right now we're planting more churches in the United States, but who knows what will be next, you know, whether we will, um, you know, through the mission, the orphanage in South Africa, we've got good connections with them and we help them a lot. So there's, there's still stuff going on internationally as well. So how about, how about what? We had uh, experiencing God that uh, we had in uh, 1998. Uh, that was a highlight for a lot of us. Uh, and the way we did it, when we did it, and all that kind of good stuff. You want to talk about that for a few moments? We were the first church to ever do that as a church, to do a study like that as a church. And um, Don said when he came to church that Sunday night, he was expecting or really maybe hoping for 500 people. And 2,000 showed up. And it was a great experience. Here again, we mixed with people that we didn't. I mean, we love all of y'all in our Sunday school class, but we don't. You know, you don't, didn't have back, at that point, you didn't have a lot of opportunities to get to know other people in other classes. And so they mixed the classes up to form the small study groups. And so that was kind of cool. We got to know other people that we otherwise would not have gotten to know. But if you haven't done Experience God ever, that's a great study. You can do it together. You can do it at home. You can do it by yourself. It's life-changing as well. So just... If I remember correctly, in 2003 or so, we uh, uh, built the hangar. I think we 2000, did. 2003. I love the story about the plane. You want to share that a little bit? The plane was, um, Seth had always had a dream that he wanted a youth building. He wanted to call it the hangar because that's where you, um, 
that's where you put planes, to, you built planes, you put them together if they needed fixing, that you, they repaired them. And so Seth always had in his heart that this was a place that kids could come, could address their problems, could be um, led to the Lord, whatever it was. So that's how the name The Hangar got started. If you haven't been in The Hangar, there are runway lights down the, down the hall, all the way down the middle of the hall. And in the snack bar, there is the plane, which you see right here. They had to put it in before they put a lid on the, I don't guess you call it lids in building, forgive me, a roof. Thank you. Uh, before they put a roof on the building, they had to put that plane in there. And the plane, um, they had to look. I don't know how many places they looked. And I think Deb, Dave Edwards was the one who finally located it yeah. in Arizona. That's correct. And they brought the plane back. They wanted a special kind of plane. They knew what kind they wanted. And so they brought that, they got it, found it finally, brought it back here. And John Ferris put it in his workshop and painted it. And um, so it became the focus of the hangar. Um, when they brought it from Union Street, from John Ferris's workshop to the church, we gathered together and walked up the street with the, with the plane. Um, one thing about the plane that, that a lot of people don't know is that we, the plane actually belongs to the city of Spartanburg. And we are leasing the plane from them. Now, I don't think they'll ever come get it back, but um, you can't well, tell them take, take it back. <laughs> now take the lid off the hangar again, right? <laughs> yeah. So after that, we had some other things going on. I think 2005, the Encouraging Word started. You want to share that a little bit? Yes. He keeps acting, looking like he's going to say something, <laughs> but he never says anything. Do you want to speak to this? No, go ahead. Um, in 2005, the Encouraging Word began with a $2 million anonymous gift. And it became, it, it, it started as a um, independent entity. Is that a good way to say it, Mike? And it you, I could add more to this than I can, but um, it was not supported by First Baptist. It was supported by the encouraging word and the funds that people, the gifts that people gave, the donations that they gave. Um, it is supported by listeners and viewers today as well. However, it has grown where, where it was in the beginning. It was, and I don't, I didn't um, look back up exactly how many stations there were, but in the beginning we weren't on very many stations. No. And now we are broadcasting INSP, we're, we're broadcasting all over the world. We are not broadcasting just in Spartanburg. We are not broadcasting just in the United States. We are literally broadcasting all over the world. And the fact that we can broadcast through the internet has just made our, the reach that we can have incredible. Um, Mike had given me a couple of statistics, which I... Um, have right here that are really, I mean, you, the over 12,000 calls were in the first year. That's not the right statistic. Do you have your thing there, Mike? My, my um, paper went uh, away. What, what you want to know? I can... Well, no, I was just going to, it has grown so much. I think over the, over the course of the years that has been in existence, the total, what's the, do you remember the total of the, um, Salvation? that have been reached? Yeah, over 4,000 have been, have called in to say that they've accepted Christ. We believe that that number is significantly larger because not everybody's going to call in. One other thing that's, uh, that I think is of significance is that the, right now the, there's over 119,000 individual telephone calls that have come into the organization uh, through, our, through our call center. And that, those numbers of calls are going up every year, every month, every week, they go up. And uh, in, in fact, I, it, it, the real challenge in, in, in dealing with the encouraging word is getting enough money into a budget to fund the call center. We increased the call center budget last year by something like 30%, and that's not enough. 
Uh, so that the ministry is actually reaching an awful lot of people. And uh, we're just real grateful for that opportunity. And your daddy was instrumental in that. And uh, so, Bill, thank you for that legacy there. Uh, yeah, the encouraging word is, go did somebody have a question or something? I, I was going to ask Mike, who mans the call center? Uh, the, we, we, there's a company that we hire called MMC. MMC is affiliated with the Encouraging Word and other ministries like the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. They're located over in Rock Hill. And anytime that you see a telephone number uh, on a, our screen, that toll-free phone number uh, goes to those folks. Now, this is how they answer the telephone call. Uh, they, and, and I think David Holliday is the one who instituted this. Good morning. Thank you for calling the encouraging word. Have you called to give your heart to Christ today? We are the only ministry in the United States that asks that when somebody calls on the phone. So um, it's, uh, those folks over in Rock Hill have been a great partner for us. They really have. So thank you for asking that. There were a number of things that have happened and um, begun during Dr. Wilton's um, ministry since he's been there. One of them is the Genesis worship. We needed to add another worship service and they decided to add a, a, a service that was more contemporary to reach out maybe, maybe to the younger people. But if you go look at who is in the audience and in the congregation, it's not necessarily the younger people on Sunday mornings. So Genesis worship began. Uh, we had impact 2005. We just, we, we began disaster relief and a ministry to the shrine bowl that it takes, um, that takes place every year. Brit and the minister, the media committee started the radio ministry. Um, P139, which has brought a number of families to our church because when we started this, there were not many, if any, churches who had a ministry specifically for special. And our ministry is led by trained people. Most of them are professional, either therapists or someone who deals with special needs kids during the week as well. And they have unselfishly given of themselves. So our P139 ministry, and we also, we have not only that for the younger kids, but we have the old, we have an older class, I believe as well still. So that's something that, you know, is, is I think very unique. Dr. Wilton's 25th anniversary was 2018. Um, that was just a great milestone for us and for our church. And um, I think it's something that uh, we are, we'll all remember, you know, because that we are so blessed. There are a lot of churches that can say, well, we had this one for 25 years and this one for 25 years. I mean, I don't blame them for not wanting to leave our church, but we are fortunate that we have had that longevity with many of our pastors. And so um, that was during the time of his, was 2018. And I think he would say, fasten your seatbelts. The best is yet to come. Linda, thank you. I have, I have one final question for you. And uh, that is, what's your favorite story in dealing with all this through the, through the years? What's your favorite story that you learned, heard, or, in, or engaged in? What, What's your favorite story? That's really not fair because there's so many wonderful stories, but I'll, I'll tell you one that I think of so often. Um, during the uh, Dr. Walker's ministry, we also began doing some fun things for the youth um, with um, parking lot concerts and pray back. When they went back to school, they would have a flat bed truck, bed truck excuse me, and pray for all the students and teachers. But during the time that our son was probably six or seven, he was taking drum lessons. And they were having a concert on the back, uh, back, back lot, back parking lot. It was actually exactly where the preschool building sits now. And they had the stage up there and they had set up chairs. And so 
we get our children and we head out the door and Jeff is behind the girls and I see sticking out of his back pocket, his drumsticks. And I said, Jeff, what do you need your drumsticks for? He turned around and looked at me. He said, mom, what if the drummer gets sick and they need me? <laughs> well, I didn't know how the drummer's health was, but I said, okay, take your sticks. And we got there and, you know, they have this, we have the cement pylons or whatever you call those things that hold the lights up. Well, he drummed the entire time on that pylon. But while I was sitting there watching him do that and how much he was enjoying it and everybody was enjoying it, but I looked over and there was um, my sister's father-in-law who at the time was probably in his 80s. He may have been in his early 70s, uh, late 70s. He was sitting there all by himself. And the concert was loud and the kids were active. And I didn't know really how he would take that. there. And he was not the only one of that age there. But then about a third of the way through, I saw him get up and leave. And I thought, oh, he didn't like it. It was too loud or something like that. And, and I just didn't think too much about it. Well, about 30 minutes later, he came back and he had his wife with him. And so after the concert was over, we went over to talk to him. And, um, you know, we said we were glad to see him. And um, he said, you know, this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. This is so good for our young people. I just wanted a bit to see it. That's what he called his wife. He said, I had to go home and get her and bring her back so she could see what was going on. And I love that story because when I think about Jeff in that situation, it just speaks to me so that we should always be prepared for whatever God wants us to do and to step up in the role he has given us. And so I think about that when I think about Jeff. And when I think about Bob, I think the older gentleman, I think, you know, we may have a different way of worshiping from our neighbor or from our children or from anybody else, but we are all there to worship the same amazing God that we have. And we still stand in awe of him. And we can all come to do that multi-generationally. All of us, no matter how we are, we can come together and do that together. And um, it's just a really wonderful thing when that happens. So what is it you want everybody to take away from tonight? And while you're doing that, go ahead and stop sharing your machine, uh, your screen, and we'll uh, uh, begin to wrap up. Take away from tonight. I, I just really wish that people would realize, uh, and I know a lot of you do, but that we serve an amazing God, and he has given us a, an um, just an unbelievable church with a legacy that is not stopping in 2020. It's going to continue to build and you're a part of it now. And so I think my takeaway from looking at all these fun things that, the, that happened at the church or things that we remember is to remember God's not done yet. He is going to take us much farther than 2020 unless he comes back to get us. And um, we, we do have an amazing church. And I think we can stand in awe of God and the way that he took this church in 1839, had it ministered to the wicked village of Spartanburg, and has grown it now to where we're ministering all over the world. Linda, I want to thank you and John for this evening. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I know that speaking on behalf of everybody, that everybody enjoyed it. And it's been a wonderful time to sit down and go uh, down memory lane and learn a little bit more about our church and learn what uh, how, how influential our church has been in the lives of a lot a lot of people and i know they've been influential in my life and uh, and i know they have in mike's life this church has just been absolutely a wonderful church to minister into our homes david i'm going to turn it back over to you and let you wrap it up I want to thank everybody for joining us. Linda, thank you so much. I know that was a lot to put together, and it was uh, well received. Thank you. Uh, a lot of things I didn't know, so it was it was great. So um, thank you all for joining us. Let's, let's just join together in prayer. And remember, if you have a prayer request, 
Just remind you this, have a prayer request. Be sure to send that to Lee. He'll be home tonight, but he won't get to it till tomorrow if he wakes up tomorrow after traveling from Dallas. And also, um, Mike told us, uh, you know, give somebody in our class a call. If you haven't done that yet, even if you've done it, find somebody else on the list. Give them a call. Encourage them. Pray for them. Um, and just remember to pray for our class and those needs. So let's pray together. Dear God, as we've heard the history, or some just a little bit of the history of our church, you know, when you look at the last, you know, 170 years, whatever it is, and uh, 180, whatever, and and we see what has happened, we just get just a barely glimpse of what you've done and the lives that you've touched through our church. And we pray, God, that we'll continue to be that channel that you touch other lives and spread the gospel and encourage people in their walk. Lord, help each one of us to be that to other people. Lord, that that um, our ministry, just like other ministries, touch just life after life after life. And we are thankful for that. More than anything, God, we thank you for your saving grace. Lord, I thank you, God, because I had come to know you opened my eyes so that I could see my need for a Savior. And Lord, I pray that you'll open our ears so that we can hear your voice directing us as to what we should do in spreading the gospel. Thank you again for our pastor, for our staff at the church. We pray for them during this pandemic that you would give them clear direction because I know they're seeking you as to how to, how to minister and the steps we need to take going forward. We give you praise for all these things. In your name we pray. Amen.